I saw this incredible piece by Rabbeinu Yonah over Shabbos. As you know, right now we are in the weeks between Pesach and Shavuos, and it is a widespread custom to learn Perte Avos as we prepare for Sinai. Of course, Perte Avos is the book about Jewish ethics and morals and how we develop ourselves into a vessel worthy of receiving Torah. And just like the Jewish people, we had a head start to get to Torah. The reason why Hashem chose us to give us his Torah is because of the forefathers. Therefore, is it is the custom of us as we try to go through the same process of preparing for Sinai and preparing for Shavuos and preparing for the Torah, we too learn about the fathers, namely Perke Avos, the book of our fathers, the ethics of our fathers, because that trains us and that primes us to become worthy of receiving the Torah. So over Shabbos, we were learning it in the shul. And I came across this incredible piece that I wanted to share with you today, a piece by the Rabbeinu Yonah commentary on Pirkei Avos. Now, as an aside, my grandfather, blessed memory, in one of his books, he has a chapter called Suras Yehudi, which means the shape or the infrastructure or the framework of a Jew. What's the framework of a Jew? And in that chapter, it's a very famous chapter, he writes that there are four critical works that every Jew needs to know really well. And that's going to be the framework, that's going to be the architecture in which we build our spiritual edifices. And those four are, the first one is Chumash, the, the, the Torah, with Rashi and Ramban, that of course connects us to the Torah, to understand the stories of the Torah, to understand the myths of the Torah, to understand the lessons of the Torah, to be abreast with the Jewish nation as we progress through the Torah each week. So that's Chumash, the Torah with Rashi's commentary and the Ramban's commentary. And then there's Mesilas Yesharim, which is the foundational work of Musar, of Jewish ethics. This is the book of what, what Torah is supposed to do to us. What are we supposed to do to make sure that we refine ourselves and make ourselves really akin to angels? And then there's the Mishnah Brura. And this is the book of Halacha, authored by the Chafetz Chaim, and is widely considered to be the final work of halacha, the last great work that is universally accepted as the final work of halacha. And finally, the fourth book that he writes, that every Jew has to know really well, is Perkriavos, which is Ethics of the Fathers, with the commentary of Rabbeinu Yonah, one of the ancient medieval commentators on the uh, the book, The Ethics of Our Fathers. And on one of the Mishnahs, the Mishnahs we learned, this is chapter 1 of Perkei Avos, Mishnah number 14. It's actually an iconic Mishnah. It's courtesy of Hillel. And the comment that he says I found to be so interesting, it's short, it's powerful, interesting, really interesting, contains a lot of lessons, and it really struck me. I figured I would share it with y'all. Now, this Mishnah is, uh, again, it's famous. It's uh, misattributed, or it was plagiarized by a lot of people. Amongst them, even Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan was the one who stole the Mishnah of Hillel. Hillel was the one, of course, who told us, he told the convert, the convert wanted to learn all of Torah while balancing on one foot. And Hillel said to him, that the you despise, that the you hate, don't do to your fellow. That's all of Torah. The rest of it is commentary. And that became known as the golden rule. And it was, of course, plagiarized by all other religions. So Hillel is used to having his words be plagiarized. And in this Mishnah, he says something that, again, was plagiarized. And this is his message of this Mishnah. In ain anili, mili. It's rhymes, which I always say, if you want to have something that's really sticky, that really gets a fit in people's minds, make it, make it rhyme. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. Everyone knows that line. Why? Because in our... It is part of our brain, the, the amygdala, it just, it just gets, it latches onto things that rhyme and it makes it, uh, makes it a little stickier. It may not nearly, mealy. If I am not for myself, who will be for me? Utrashani laats me and when I am for myself, ma'ani. What am I? Vim lo achshav, emasai. And if not now, when? So this is the Mishnah. And as is quite common with Perkyavos, you don't always have all the commentaries in unanimous agreement as to what exactly he is saying. And therefore, if you look at the commentaries, you'll find a wide variety of interpretations of this of this statement of Hillel, 
But what Rabbi Yoda says, I feel like there's so many lessons contained in how he unpatched this Mishnah, it's worthwhile to share them. So he starts off by saying that this Mishnah is talking about self-improvement. This Mishnah is talking about self-improvement, how to make the most of ourselves, how to develop our talents, how to access our potential, how to become the best that we can become. And it starts off, Im ein anili mili. If I am not going to be committed towards improving myself, no one will do that for me. Our growth and transformation must come from within. And yes, we could be aided from outside. Other people could inspire us. We could read books that inspire us. We could hear lectures that inspire us. We could be inspired externally. But ultimately, if I'm not for myself, if I'm not committed towards changing myself and improving myself and uplifting myself and transforming myself, no one will do that for me. And he says, If I'm not going to be self-critical and be willing to challenge myself and try to encourage myself and spur myself to do mitzvos, to improve myself, to refine my character, me, Lee, who will do it for me? No one else can inspire me as well as I can inspire myself. And then he says, there is a fundamental difference between the inspiration we get from others and the inspiration that is homegrown, that comes from ourselves, imminent inspiration. He says, His orus acherim, if you're inspired by others, tov hu lefisha. It helps for a moment, for an hour. It's a little spark that could ignite something, but the spark quickly dies. It's good, but it's good for an hour. But if someone is inspired by themselves, the engine, so to speak, that they have of inspiration is from within. Someone like that, he is able or he's going to be inspired at all times under all situations to always be planning and thinking and his mind is always going to be awake and looking for ways to improve himself. And because this comes from within, within, therefore, it's going to really spur him and encourage him to proceed ahead, to forge ahead. So to me, this is a really interesting idea that not all inspiration, not all excitement and, and, and impetus and, and, and energy to progress, it's not all the same. Because if you have someone tell you something, I remember when I was in yeshiva in high school. So, you know, you're young, you got a, a fertile mind and you're curious about things and you're in a yeshiva environment and you're trying to improve yourself or at least, you know, you have the rabbim, the teachers, and they're trying to encourage you to to get into learning Talmud and to get into working on your midos and working on your character and focusing on your prayer and how to, how to pray with more devotion. And that's the environment of yeshiva. And then I remember like when, when I was young, you hear like a lecture, you hear a, a musr shmuz, a musr discourse, and you're really moved and you're really inspired. And you say, I'm committed, I'm, I'm all in, whatever it takes. And then what happens two days later, three days later, it just, it, it just dissipates. It goes away. That external inspiration fizzles out. And it never made sense to me, you know, why, why, why is that so? Now we know he's telling us something very fundamental. This is the message of Hillel that if someone is personally independently motivated, that is orders of magnitude more powerful, more potent to propel someone down a road, down a path, than when someone is motivated extrinsically from without, outside, someone else can inspire them. It's great, a little spark, but right away it ceases to have any power and any weight and it could just fizzle out. So to me, that was a nice introduction to get us started in this Mishnah. Okay, and then it continues, Ukisha'ani la'atzmi ma'ani. And when I am for myself, meaning if I am motivated and I am inspired and I don't even need someone else to inspire me. I don't need someone to fire me up. I'm already fired up. Ma'ani. What am I? What have I truly accomplished? And he explains to me this, like, this was one of the lines that kind of caught my attention. If I focus on making the most out of myself and I'm committed to squeezing out all of my potential. I'll read this line in Hebrew because you won't believe me. 
ממה שאני חייב לעשות. If someone is completely motivated, they're totally on board, committed, they're still not able to acquire or to access one one thousandth of what they need to do. The actual potential that we have is so incredibly vast and the expectations that are foisted upon us are so great that even if someone is completely fired up and they're totally on board and they're totally inspired and they're totally firing on all cylinders, the output, money, what am I? What's the output? It's about a thousandth of what you really could do. And he, he explains why. He says... He gives a nice example here. He says that there was a, there was a, there's a king and the king has a field and he gives the field to one of his servants and he says, every year I want you to produce, you know, 30 bushels or 30 acres, whatever, 30 units of grain. And the guy's working really hard at the field and plowing and planting and tilling and pulling out all the weeds and he's really committed towards producing the output that the king wants. And after the year is over, instead of having 30 bushels, all he has is five. And he comes to the king, and the king says, what happened? Where, where are my 30 bushels? And he says, well, the land that you gave me, it's not great land. It doesn't produce great produce. And therefore, even though I worked really hard... Ultimately, I didn't really yield. I didn't live up to the expectations that you had for me. And he explains, so too, we have to realize that we're facing great headwinds in our, in our pursuit of greatness in life. We have a Yetzahara. We have a force within us that is trying to stop us at every turn, that is throwing these curveballs and obstacles and problems our way to try to torpedo any growth that we have. And even if someone works really hard, to do what Hashem wants of him. He says, I really want to do what Hashem wants of me. Still, a person could really only do a small bit of what he is really expected to do. And then he adds, Shem lo ba'adam, if a person did not have this Yitzhara, how would a person behave? What would a person do? Even without hard work, he would relentlessly and doggedly pursue mitzvos, and he would be like the proverbial field. They don't even have to plant anything. You don't need to plant anything, and right away it produces a tremendous amount. And his point over here is, is that our soul in our capacity, if we just removed the inhibitors, it would produce, we're higher than angels. This is a common motif in Jewish philosophy, that the soul of a person, the neshama, the soul of a person, is actually much loftier than angels. There's nothing that, it, like an, we think of an angel, an angel is able to do whatever it wants, you know, total power, unbridled power, our soul is even more powerful. And the only reason why we are so limited in our upside, our, our spiritual upside, because of the Yetzara. And that shows us, he's trying to impress upon us the, the, the power of our antagonist. The amount of power that we actually have is a thousand times more than what we could produce if we tried our hardest. If you try your hardest and don't stop for a second, completely committed, you're doing about a thousand of what you would have done absent the Yetzara. That's his point. And therefore, that's showing us the, the, the strength of our foe, of our adversary. We have something within us, which the Talmud, by the way, describes as a foreign god. It has godlike powers. God, of course, with a lowercase g. But it's such a formidable foe, because look how powerful it is. Absent the eight Sahara, you would do a thousand times more than you could possibly, potentially do if you worked your hardest with the eight Sahara. And therefore, all the more so, when you realize the intensity of the strength of your adversary, all the more so he's encouraging us to be up to the task of putting on a good fight, of resisting its temptations. Imlo etrach ve'ores atzim l'chazerach ha'mitzvos eshar 
realize what kind of foe you are matching up against, realize how many headwinds you have, and make sure that at least whatever it is that you can do, you do that and don't end up with absolutely nothing. That's how he interprets the uh, the second part of this Mishnah. And finally, the imlo achshav emasayad, if not now, when? If not now, when? And to this, he actually brings four arguments, four different arguments for urgency, for urgency. If not now, when? Right now? Right now is, is the time to start. Right now. Why? Why not uh, wait a little bit of time? What is the sense of urgency? Why is it so important for us to try to maximize our greatness and and relentlessly pursue what we're here to do, the agenda of our soul? Why is it so important for us? Why is it so imperative for us to do that right away, to start right now? If you don't start right now, then you're doomed. Why is it so important to have that sense of urgency? So he gives us four reasons for that. Shalom Yom, our person should not say, Hayom Ani Asav Malachti. Today I'll focus on other, other matters, my, my other agenda. Ulamachar, and tomorrow I'll have more time and I'll be able to fix myself. I'll be able to refine myself. I'll be able to develop my character. I'll, I'll be able to focus on those mitzvahs and really think about the agenda of the soul and think about my eternal life and eternal existence. I'll, I'll deal with it tomorrow. Why is that a bad argument? He gives us four very compelling and very interesting reasons. Number one, Shema Lo Yipana. How do you know that you will have the great gift of life for another day? You don't know that. The great mystery of our life, the thing that the Gemara says that no one is really able to know is when they're going to die. This is the great Gemara that tells us the Talmud tells us about King David, who really wanted to know when he's going to die. And God says, sorry, even King David, you don't get to know when you're going to die. And he says, well, at least tell me what day of the week it's going to be. And uh, he said, well, it's going to be on Shabbos. It's going to be on Shabbos. He says, oh, I don't want to be on Shabbos. I don't want to be dead on Shabbos. And there's a whole great story about that in the Gemara. But even King David doesn't know when they're going to die. So it's possible that this is your last day here. And there's no way for you to know. Only the Almighty knows that. Even though your soul knows it. Our Satanists tell us that the soul already knows 30 days before passing when it's going to die. It has already a message that it's about to go home, prepare your bads. You know, the itinerary for the soul is set. But our consciousness is not always in line with the soul, so we don't necessarily know when it's our time to go. And therefore, we should repent and make sure that we're doing whatever we can for our soul and its agenda every day of our lives, because maybe tomorrow or today is my last day. And therefore, we have to have a sense of urgency because we are sent here on a critical mission by God. And our mission is to fix ourselves and to improve ourselves and to refine ourselves and to restore our soul or to bring our soul back to God in its pristine state. And I have to work really hard and really urgently right now because I can never be sure that I'll have another chance. That's his argument number one. Why urgency is absolutely critical. Okay, number one. Number two, Va'afilu im yipane, and even if, even if, you have plenty of time, suppose you knew for sure that you're going to live to 150 or 100. You got plenty of time left to go. Nevertheless, every day, and every moment really, it's its own unit of time. The Zohar actually says that every day the soul is slightly different. When you go to sleep, the soul goes up to heaven. You wake up, Modani, you say Modani, thank you, Shah, for giving me back my soul. But the soul is slightly different than it was yesterday. There's a different spark that you have within you that this is the soul of today and it's different than the soul of, of yesterday. And therefore, every day is really its own little lifetime. Because this particular soul is in you for this particular day, or this makeup of the soul is within you this day, and that's the only day that you have this particular soul, or this particular arrangement of a soul. And therefore, every single day is a lifetime for that particular version, makeup of you as that person. So yes, 
collectively, even if you worked the last 50 years of your life to make sure that you're refined, but all those years and all those days and all those moments that you missed, well, there's parts of you where the, those spiritual entities are not refined. And therefore, if you don't fix it, if you don't have that sense of urgency, then those days are lost. That day that you missed, you can't make up for it the rest of your life. Every day that you're you're alive, that day is its own spiritual entity, its own little entity in time, its own little lifetime. Every day it's its own little lifetime. And therefore, you gotta make sure that on this lifetime, on this day, you are doing what the Almighty expects of you. So that's the second argument. The first argument is you have to have urgency because you never know that. You'll have the time to do it. Maybe this is your last day. Maybe you're not going to make it to tonight. How do you know? You won't be hit by a car. You'll be struck by lightning. You won't have, God forbid, an aneurysm or something like that. How do you know? You have no idea. We're we're flying blind over here. Argument number one. Argument number two, even if you do know that you have plenty of time, there's still a sense of urgency because every single day is its own day that you have to do what the matter is to you. And if you if you fix your life and you repent yourself, you repent at the end of your, your days, of course, you come up to heaven pure, but nevertheless... There is a day, and that spiritual entity has to be has to be fixed, and therefore we have to have a sense of urgency in our spiritual lives. Argument number two, and then he says, "This I found to be really interesting." What's his third argument for urgency? So he says, "Imlo achshav, if not now, right now, you are the youngest that you will ever." be again. This is the youngest you'll ever be again. So you used to be younger and that's too late. That's th- that, Those decisions have already been etched in the book of life and the book of chronicles in heaven. That's already done. All your deeds are already inscribed in a book. That book has already been written. The book of the past, it's behind you. There's no way for you to alter that. Well, maybe you could repent and you can maybe alter. That's the miracle of repentance. But as a general rule, the past is the past. And then all you have now is you're just getting older. So therefore, right now, you're the youngest you'll ever be again. And now is the time to fix. Why? Because once you get old, it becomes harder and harder to change. The older you get, the more set in your ways you get, and the more impliable you are, the more rigidly a fixed in place you are, the less malleable you are, and therefore the harder it is to change. And he, he brings this great analogy. The verse in, in Scripture in, in Psalms says, Asher igudalim, that our children are like, like a grown saplings or grown plants. And he explains when you have a small tree, you have a small tree, just recently planted, you could manipulate the growth of that tree. And that's what you'll see very often. If there's a new tree planted, they'll put like a little fence around it and they'll have streams on either side to hold it straight. Why? Because now it's growing and it's affixing its roots and the direction that it's growing now, you, you could choose. If you want it to go like this, to the right, to the left, go straight up, you could just hold it straight up and it will grow straight up. And it won't be corrupted. It won't be crooked. But if you have a tree that was neglected in its youth and it grew askew and now it's not straight, it's impossible to fix it. So too, man, says Rabbeinu Yonah. When you are young, Man's like a tree. Of course, the verse tells us in, in Scripture, in the Torah, Ha'adam eats asada. Man is compared to a tree. And that's, again, a common motif in, in Jewish philosophy that we're like a tree. Uh, our sages tell us that we're like a tree, but it's an upside-down tree. A tree has its roots in the ground. The roots of man are really in heaven. So we're like a tree, but we're suspended upside-down, so to speak. But, of course, another way to understand this is that, you know, the tree, there's parts of the tree's the parts of the tree that are not visible, right? There's parts of the tree that are invisible, that you cannot see. And that really is the life of the tree. And then you have a tree, if you have a tree that looks really strong, but doesn't have any roots, it may look alive, but it's really dead. And 
the way to determine the life and the vitality of the tree is to find out how the invisible parts of that tree are doing, not how the visible parts of the tree are doing. Similar to us, you know, we have an invisible soul, and that really determines our life. And the parts of us that are exposed, that are manifested, the physical parts that can be seen, those parts really don't tell the, the full story. Like the Gemara says, the Gemara in Brachas famously says, that the Rashaim, the wicked, in their lifetime, are really dead. They look alive, but the invisible parts of them are dead, those roots, so to speak, those spiritual roots are not present or not strong, and therefore they are dead when they appear to be alive. Really interesting idea. So if man's like a tree, the way you change it, the way you manipulate it, the way you get it to grow nice and straight is in their youth. Kena Adam, so to men, but then or now, when they are young, it's easy to get the person to do what's right. To manipulate children, not manipulate, it's a strong word. But to indoctrinate, oh, also a strong word. To educate a child, these are just different words for the same thing. To educate a child properly, it's much easier because they're much more malleable. Those roots haven't gotten so fixed in place. But then when they're still young, Kalios got the It's easy for them to grow in a, in a proper straight way and to deviate from the, from, from bad. But if they are old, and they're all corrupted and twisted. Is it possible for us to fix it? And he quotes the famous verse in scripture, in Mishle, in Proverbs 22, Chanoch Lanaro Pidarko, educate a child, raise a child, as per their way, Gam Kiyasno Also, when they get old, they won't depart from it. So the idea that he's saying is that it's easy to raise a the child, they're like a tree, and once they are a fixed in place, once they mature, and they're still straight, they're not crooked, it's actually hard to change that as well. And that's the, almost like the insurance policy. You raise the kid well, and they, and they are, they're flourishing, and they're, they're getting firmer and firmer in their roots like a tree, and therefore it's much harder to knock them off their game, because now they've been raised well, this proverbial tree is, is, you know, is facing straight up, and that's why they are in, in really good shape. Over Shab, as someone pointed out, that the, the tzaddik is compared to a, a palm tree. So he wanted to suggest that like a palm tree is very straight, very straight. And he also pointed out that the, the cedar trees, our spiritual trees, are very, the cedar trees, we build the temple of the cedar, the cedar trees. The Arze Alavana, the, 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 the tzaddikim, the righteous people are compared to cedar trees, very straight trees. Maybe that's part of this analogy that they were raised well, and they, they're strong, and they are affixed in place in the proper way. That's his third argument. Why is there a need for urgency? You're the youngest knight you'll ever be, and therefore you're the most malleable that you will ever be. And how do we want to impact you? Well, now's the best time that it'll ever be. If not now, when? Because if if you're... Not going to be able to do it now. It's going to be much, much harder in the future because every second that you wait, every moment that you wait, you're getting older and older and the tree's getting thicker and thicker and more affixed and more cemented into place. And therefore, there is a need for urgency. And finally, his fourth argument as to why there's an imperative for urgency in rectifying our ways, in improving our ways, in refining our ways, and that is because if we want to fix ourselves at the very end, let me live a good life, have a good time, enjoy myself, be able to do what I want, but I'll, I'll get to it. I know, I, be- I believe I have a soul, I believe it's my mission here to fix the soul, I have temptations, I have a difficult time, but I'm not going to neglect the soul. I'll, I'll get to it before I die. And again, we're assuming that they are going to live a long time, they'll have plenty of time to fix it. Nevertheless. It's really hard to do complete repentance at an old age. Because repentance at an old age, is not complete, perfect repentance. Why? Someone gets old and their testosterone wanes a little bit and their desires get weakened a little bit. And the Yetzirah is not quite as strong as it was in their youth. And they're not so interested in the, all the things that they chased as a, as a younger person. 
Vain lo chafetz vahano baveros. They're all, they're cranky. They're not so interested in chasing and running and pursuing and doing all the silly things of their youth. Vain lo chafetz vahano baveros. If someone's old, they, they have no desire for averos. And then he adds, Vizos yasiba yalav lechuva. And that may be the reason why they do tshuva. They're not doing tshuva because they want to fix what they did. It's because they're not, just not desirous of it anymore. And that's the, re, the real motivation. And therefore, he says it's still repentance, but it's not complete repentance. So it's interesting to me, the, 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 these four arguments, the third and the fourth really are, are almost opposite. The third argument is, well, when you're younger, you're more malleable. It's much easier to improve your ways as a young person. And then in the fourth one, he's saying that actually to repent when you're young is much harder because that's when you're full of desires and your Yitzhahar is strong and that's where the real conflict and the real challenge is. And that's why when you when you do repent, when you get older, it's, it's actually not complete repentance because, well, the real, the real motivation is that you weren't really interested in it. And he ends with a verse in Kohelas in, in Ecclesiastes, to remember your creator in the days of your youth, before the bad days come and the years pass by and you arrive at the time where you say, there are days that I have no desire. And the way he interprets that is that once you are at a desire and you don't have that same flame and passion that you had as a youth and you're repenting because you're just too lazy or too incapable of doing what you did as a youth, well, then it's, it's repentance. It's important, but it is incomplete. So I just found this to be such an interesting little piece of how he reads into Hillel, just these these fascinating ideas about what we need to do in our life here. We, what we're here for is to refine ourselves. You know, we were delivered here with a soul that's like a precious soul, a refined soul, a polished soul, a soul that came from the absolute loftiest places in existence, uh, a soul, that, again, loftier than angels. And it's brought to this world and it's thrown into this chaos. The Medrash compares it to chaos of, uh, of someone being thrown overboard into the raging ocean. And there is, there are real threats to the neshama. The, the, the soul is under threat. It's under duress. It is hovering, balancing between life and death. And our job and the role of Torah is, is to help us overcome that. And, you know, we're, we're now in the time preparing for Torah. And this is what we're learning about. And to me, this was such a powerful idea. These, I'll call, we'll call it six ideas that he says over here. Number one, inspiration is key. Inspiration is key. If you do nothing, the, the, uh, the deck is stacked against us. You know, if you don't do anything, if you just allow life to take, take its course, just the default, the default state of man is such that they will regress spiritually and their soul will just become further sullied within them and it will be further exposed to the ravages of the Yetzirah and of sin and, and lose its place in life. And the reason, of course, for that is because the soul is not sensory. The soul is an idea. It's theoretical. It's part of, the, part of that invisible part of us that we don't see. The whole physical world that's, you know, it's very visceral. It's much more real to us. We have to be convinced about the existence of our soul. We have to be persuaded that it's even true. But of course, the world around us, it's much more real to us. And that's the conflict of life. And we have to be inspired to that. And the real way to do it is to be personally inspired. Because I think if someone is personally inspired, they're going to do whatever it takes to get there. And the the the, the tzadik that falls seven times and gets up, why does he get up? Because he is relentlessly committed towards success. And if you are relentlessly committed to success, you will find a way to do it. And then he tells us that the, the headwinds are so stiff that if we work our hardest, we'll get about a thousandth of what we could have done absent those headwinds. And that shows us just how fierce the resistance is. And again, once we realize how imperative it is for us to accomplish what we need to accomplish in this, in this life, we have to make sure that we don't leave anything to chance. We work as hard as we possibly can towards refining ourselves. And when's the time to do that? The time is now. We never know that we'll have another time. You can never be guaranteed that you'll have another moment. Even if you do have extra time, what about all the missed opportunities? 
When you are young, you're like a tree. It's able to be molded and directed in its youth. And when you repent as an old person, it's not quite as complete. I was thinking like just this this comment. If you read it inside, it's really short. It's really short. And I feel like it could give us an entire an entire master class on on how to develop ourselves, how to improve ourselves. You know, that's really what it's all about. My grandfather used to even say that even Torah, Torah is a tool. Of course, Torah, Torah is that's what we have from Hashem. But why do we get it from Hashem? It's a tool for us to perfect ourselves and refine ourselves. That's what it's all about. Abraham perfected and refined himself without Torah. How did he do that? That's a hard question to answer. He's Abraham, and that's how he did it. Moshe was so refined that he was able to get the Torah and negotiate with angels before he had Torah, just because he went to get it. So the goal is for us to be refined and and perfected, and for us to be gentle and kind and angelic and noble and dignified and to maintain the stature of, of who we actually are as, as just a soul walking in this crazy world. And Torah too is a tool. And that's really what our life's conflict is all about. And we learn these amazing lessons. We have to be inspired. We have to know our enemy and know that it's really knocking out 999 out of a thousand units of success that we could possibly have. That's how strong it is. And the time to get down to work is right now, right now. And if you're listening to this and you're inspired, you should know that it's not going to last. It's not going to last because if it comes externally, it just it doesn't have quite that same power. We find a way to make it that we're personally motivated and we're always scheming and thinking of new ways to improve and always have a new plan. I remember when I was in at the Mir Yeshiva in Israel. So the great legendary Rosh Hashiv was, was Rav Nassim Tzvi Finkel, Rabbi Finkel. And very often he would launch, he would always, he's always launching new initiatives. Always. Always trying to find a new frontier. And he always have a, like a new, uh, a new operation, a new challenge to the, to the students of the yeshiva. And you, you see some people like that, people who are always thinking and strategizing of new things that they could embark upon, of new challenges they could give to themselves, of new ideas that they could that they could experiment with. That's someone who's who's motivated because after all, that's really what life's all about. And that is what we're going to be judged before the Almighty when we have our audience with him and we have the guidance of Hillel to show us how to do it. And of course, as interpreted by Rabbi Yona, if this is all that we had, I feel like this, if this is in this one mission, this one comment to this mission, if this is all that we had, we would have enough motivation and enough framework to build for ourselves a plan of self-improvement and self-refinement that will eventually result in us accomplishing what the Almighty expects of us and reaching our great potential. And of course, my hope and the prayer is that as we are preparing for Shavuos and we're reading the Perkei Avos and we, we learn this lesson, we in fact will take it to heart and we'll take real significant steps to improve ourselves and refine ourselves and polish ourselves. In the words of the Arachayim, the days of the Omer, the counting of the Omer, the Sphira Saomer, the word Sphira, which means the count, but it comes from the word sapphire. Why? This is the time to refine ourselves like a sapphire. May we be refined like a sapphire, like a gemstone in our march to Shavuos. I thank you for listening. My email address is rabbiwalbajima.com.